as far as oversight, uh, this is going to be very transparent and clear. I, I, I think it was a victory for the sportsmen to have their council, which is named the Senator Bob Lassard, uh, Heritage Council, I think he's proud of that. This is his legacy. Uh, he's, wor he's worked hard for it for a decade. But he would say that it was very important to the groups that got behind this, like Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, the biggest sporting groups in Minnesota, know this is good for the state. They pushed very hard to be involved in the process because they want to make sure that it's invested locally and it's invested right. But at the end of the day, after they make their recommendations, the state legislature, uh, senators and representatives are going to vote this up or down. I mean, they will still appropriate the money. So it's not like these uh, groups are, are, are just taking the money for themselves and investing it. At the end of the day, the state legislature will still have to appropriate the money, and that's another layer of oversight. So what I would say is we've learned from other states, we can do this if the funding is adequate, with clear plans on how to invest the money. And I would say that's what this is. Respond to that. Um, in the world of the legislature, money is power. And um, when you've got 12 people uh, who have the opportunity to spend this kind of money, um, you know, they have incredible power. Uh, and I, I will say, uh, it's very interesting to hear the sportsmen's group out there uh, encouraging support for the bill, saying that, oh, you're going to have your, your real chance now to be at the table and make decisions. The grassroots is going to get, you know, the things they want out of the legislature, finally. You're going to be able to touch this and feel it, and you're going to have your say. And, and I think that the, uh, the lottery money and the LCMR has sort of proven that even though there are citizens on, on the council, that in the end, it remains the few powerful legislators who take that bill to the floor, who can change out a project because that's the one they want, um, and thereby, in effect, sort of neutralize the, uh, the input of the citizen members. So I'm not so sure that they fully understand how this is going to work themselves. There's a few fairly naive folks uh, that are, are out promoting it. Um, so, um, you know, it's a, it's a process that in the end is coming down, in this case, to four legislators. And I sat in the legislature, and frankly, if you haven't had your, your, your hands into it, and in, you know, you're up to your elbows in the information, you kind of are want to say, um, you know, I, we delegated this to you, uh, we're holding you accountable, uh, you four legislators, we're going to assume everything in here is perfect. So, <coughs> simply because of the way it's structured, it, it doesn't have the same same involvement. So um, here again, I, I just say, you know, we got, we have concerns, and uh, I don't know that they'll, they'll be, you know, they'll get to the people who can make a difference and make, uh, make sure that the right decisions are made. Um, Mr. Professor, uh, Mr. Brumbeck brings up the point that uh, four legislators will be held accountable for the money. Uh, what will actually happen? Me, what are the consequences, rather, if the money is misspent, so to speak? Well, I would say the same as with the bill. I, I mean, this, the legislature, uh, I, I still have faith in them. They're, they're, they're good folks that go to the Capitol every year that are trying to make their state a better place. Uh, so this funding will come up for a vote after the citizens' input. Citizens will have their input, the people who serve on either the Outdoor Heritage Board, the, the Clean Water piece, the Parks and Trails. But it, it is up to the legislators. They still will have their say, and I think that it's... Um, at the end of the day, they should still have the state's best interest at heart. Um, you know, so this is a kind of an, an easy one. I think that they are still held responsible, and that is why I would almost consider this uh, double transparency. I hope that the people who go there for each of the individual councils comes with the state's best interest, and also the legislators who, at the end of the day, appropriate the money. Mr. Brown, what are the consequences? I'm sorry. What of uh, 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 spending the money, so to speak? Well, I mean, I think there's so much about this that isn't known. Um, first of all, it's three, well, $200 million for, for the out of doors. We haven't talked about the money for the arts, by the way, and the arts are now getting $10 million in government funding every year. Um, and so this is going to uh, increase by five-fold the amount of money going for the arts. And, of course, here again, it's uh, totally ignoring what the private sector and private individuals are donating to the arts community. Um, and so I guess, you know, I would question, uh, like Joe Sushere does, government art. 
uh, I, I think that much money has uh, very questionable um, questionable uses. But 200 million enter the outer doors. I have to, have to just relate it to an experience I had when I was in the legislature. I served on a child abuse prevention council that received four million dollars every two years um, that we were able to give out to grants to nonprofits around the state. And um, so three to four million, this is 300 million. And literally by the second or third year, it became necessary to hire an outside analyst at the tune to the tune of 500,000, or about a sixth of it, simply to monitor, to find out how the money was being spent. Is it is it being you know it, it, did, are they doing what they said they would do, um, and that sort of thing. So to think that there won't be overhead and and millions of dollars of overhead in order to actually you know proceed in granting the money. Um, is very naive. There and will, in, this there will in this particular case, what were the consequences? The consequences are that um, that we'll have, we'll have we'll have no no out. We don't have any solution to bad spending by by these groups um, that we can get our hands on. You know, as voters, we can unelect people. Um, I, I, you know, anytime. You hand something off to un unelected people, you have really put the citizens, I think, at a tremendous disadvantage because it's just that much harder to get the information. Um, it, it's it's not it's not a good process. That's the consequence. It, we have no idea. We'll have very little idea um, because <laughs> you know these are eight people. Eight of the twelve don't have any responsibility to any of us. In fact, we can pretty well certain. They've been handpicked because they have they have a very specific interest. Um, they have a very specific agenda. Um, they don't represent, for heaven's sakes, uh, all of Minnesotans. Um, you know, what do they see as their role? So, you know, it, this is the reason that you know all the newspapers have opposed the bill. Um, so, come on, it's <laughs> it's fraught, fraught with problems. Okay. Do you have a rebuttal, Mr. Foster? Yes. Uh, no one, I don't think anyone we talked to disagrees with the need to invest in, in you know, clean water, our fish, game, and wildlife habitat. They, they all actually read these very important uh, areas. Uh, uh, many <coughs> members of the coalition talk about how this is, these are really areas that make Minnesota great, including the arts. You know, we have a vibrant arts community that we should be proud of. And this isn't going to go to me, you know, this, don't think about this as, uh, going to the Guthrie and the Walker. This is really about going into all 87 counties through the Minnesota State Arts Board to, to make sure the local community theaters are able to make it and there is uh, arts access for youth. But what I would say is that the people who support even these things and they oppose this, I would just ask one thing. If not this, if, if we've seen a steady decline over the last 30 years down to next year will be less than 1% towards conservation, how are we going to do it? So even um, the opponents, the Farm Bureau opposes this, but their president, Kevin Papp, got up and sang the praises of our natural beauty. You know, 10,000 lakes, he's a big fisherman, he's a hunter. He said, you know, these are all really great areas. We support them personally. But they, they make this kind of ivory tower argument that we shouldn't do this through the Constitution. Our question back is, if we don't do it this way, given the history, how do you see it happening in the future? I think the only way to predict the future is to look to the past. I mean, you know, the old saying, those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. So, given Minnesota's past, uh, really, abdication of, of uh, funding, funding these items, I don't see how we change course without this. It hasn't happened in the past, and I don't really see it happening in the future without it.